Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Welcome back to the program again this week. Thank you for joining us as we begin this fourth segment uh, that we're teaching on Deborah and J.L. in the book of Judges. And this entire series is available for you to watch on our YouTube channel. If you've missed any of them, uh, we are saying, I think, some very, very powerful and important things you don't want to miss. And if you have missed any of these, you can go back and watch them on demand on our YouTube channel. You can also listen to the audio portions of it uh, uh, through your podcast or RSS feed for your Android device. One of the things I love is when I'm traveling, I I'll sometimes put YouTube and stream it through my uh, Apple Play in my car and listen to preaching or teaching. It's a good way to redeem time if you commute a lot and to really get in the Word of God. I think it'll strengthen you through the day if you'll start your day out like that. But they are available there on YouTube. And the easiest way to get there is simply to go to my website at lynnhiles.com and there is a link there in the upper right-hand corner of the website that will take you directly to our YouTube channel and to our podcast. That's the easiest way because I, if you just Google my name or put my name in YouTube, it'll come up everywhere because we have preached in so many places that people share videos we've preached at their church. But my channel is linked to my website, and you can sign up there for it. And uh, it abs- costs you absolutely nothing if you subscribe to that channel. And uh, we will, uh, when you subscribe, it, you receive an email that lets you know when we've uploaded a new program. And we do something almost every week. And I think you'd be blessed by that. If you'd like to sow a seed while you're there at the website, there's an easy way to do that through our PayPal portal. So that's good for you to know. And uh, I think you'd be blessed by doing that. We are talking about Deborah. We've come through several of these Judges And what this book of Judges is about, again, is we're trying to show you some new covenant concepts and ideas through Old Testament types and shadows. As I shared before, the book of Joshua opens by saying, Now Moses, my servant, is dead. Arise now, Joshua, and take the people into the promised land. So the book of Joshua is about Moses being removed and Joshua bringing you into the promised land. Now, the Hebrew name Joshua is the Hebrew name Yeshua. So Moses brought you out, but Yeshua will bring you in. Yeshua is the Hebrew name Jesus. So the book of Joshua is a picture of Jesus leading you out of an old covenant paradigm and into the promised land and in the New Testament, (coughs) Hebrews 4. The promised land is not a piece of real estate. It's rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So when we lead us into that promised land, there's an outflow of milk and honey. Then we come to the next book, which is the book of Judges. And that book opens by saying, now after the death of Joshua, or after the death of Yeshua, said another way, after the death of Jesus. So after the death of Jesus in the New Testament, there are 12 apostles. He says, you will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jesus hands the kingdom to 12 judges. In the Old Testament, when Joshua dies, after the death of Joshua, Yeshua, or Jesus, he hands it to 12 judges. And what we have been showing you is that these 12 judges picture something of a judgment executed through the new covenant. We showed you about Ehud, how that the two-edged dagger he had is Hebrews 4. He thrust it in the belly of the obese Eglon king, and who was heavy with flesh, and he thrust his in that two-edged dagger. Well, that two-edged sword is mentioned in the book of Hebrews, where he said, now the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder between soul and spirit. It is a discerner of the thought and the intent of the heart. But that's not any word. That's the word that flows from rest. That's the context of Hebrews 4. We showed you about Shamgar, and how Shamgar said the highways were unoccupied in his day. And we talked about uh, that, uh, that uh, he, uh, in the book of Isaiah, he said that he would make a highway in the desert and that he would 
open up a way, and that way we showed you was the new covenant highway where Jesus said uh, in the New Testament, straight is the gate and narrow is the way, not that leads to heaven, but leads to life. All of those are pictures of what was given to us and exacted to us as believers through the death of Jesus. So as we execute these judgments, it is us standing in faith to enforce what was already paid for. And we shared with you out of Psalm 149 where he said, This honor have all of his saints to execute the judgment written. And they do it by saying, letting the high praises of God be in their mouth, a two-edged sword in their hand, by singing a new song. And every one of those things in Psalm 149 are icons that point to the new covenant. Sing a new song. That's the new covenant. Uh, let the sharp two-edged sword be in their hand. That's also the word that flows from rest. Let them sing aloud from their bed. That's the posture of rest. Let the children of Zion be joyful. Zion is a picture of the new covenant. According to Hebrews 12, we didn't come to Mount Sinai. We've come to Mount Zion. So we're talking about the transition here from law to grace and executing then the judgment that was written. So we come to Deborah, and I'm not going to go back and read the text, but just to reiterate, Deborah to me is a woman. She speaks to me of the soul. Suke, the Greek word for suke, soul, is a feminine term in gender in the Greek language. If that's not enough for you, David said, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble will hear thereof and be glad. Sisera was the enemy of Israel, and Sisera's name means to be at battle. It means it is a, uh, a like a war horse. Sisera's name means to, uh, to set, it, med it means meditation. It means a field of battle. It means to set in battle array. It means to bind in chains. A sea of horses, the root word equals to leap onward or to onset. The thought to me is that this is dealing with the battle that's in our mind. So our carnal mind, the thinking we need, let, let the mind of Christ be in us that was in Christ Jesus. Now, let me just say this specifically, because when I think about the carnal mind, I, there's a lot of stuff that could be said about it. But it's not just I had an evil thought. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, carnal, the word carny, carnivore, carnivorous are all Greek words that have to do with the meat, the flesh, the strength of the human effort. To be carnally minded is to be a meathead. Now, let me just tell you that when we get into the New Testament and he starts to talk about being carnally minded, he's saying it many times in the context of thinking you can do this through old covenant performance-based religious systems. Now, see, I can tell you that when he writes the book of Galatians, Paul writes the book of Galatians, he says, you started out in the spirit. Do you think you're going to be made perfect in the flesh? What Paul calls being in the flesh in the book of Galatians is trying to do this through circumcision, through human effort, through the performances of the law. He also says that, I believe it is in Romans, the seventh chapter, when we were under the law, we were in the flesh. When we were in the flesh, we were under the law. And the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members. So he's telling you at least one aspect of being carnally minded. I'm not doing away with the other. I'm just trying to tell you that sometimes we think carnally minded is I had a bad thought. But sometimes some of the most carnally minded people on the planet are religious people who think their performance, based on legalism and law, is what gets them in. And so that's the war that goes on in our soul and our mind. But God had a woman by the name of Deborah who was under a palm tree. A palm tree is a symbol of the righteousness of God. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. He'll grow like the cedars in Lebanon. So to me, when I see Deborah under a palm tree, it's somebody whose mind has been stayed on the fact that my righteousness is not volatile. It's based on a free gift of Jesus Christ. She leads the battle into battle array, and, uh, and, and the battle is set in motion, and she leads this battle. She leads the king into battle, and they begin to uproot, and uh, they begin to win the battle against Sisera, whose name again means to have warfare, or chains and bondages, binding chains, even in thoughts of our mind, pulling down strongholds. And she begins to lead this battle, and then the king Sisera is fleeing for his life, and he goes into the tent of Jael. 
Jael is the wife of Heber, I believe it is, and she has a nail. Heber means to cross over. Eber is the root word for the word Hebrews. The word Hebrews means the crossers over. The book of Hebrews itself is a book that means the crossing over. But this time they're not crossing over a physical Jordan. They're crossing over. The book of Hebrews is about leaving behind an old covenant paradigm and crossing over into the new covenant because everything about the book of Hebrews is better blood, better promises, a better tabernacle, a better priesthood, better offerings, everything about it, better faith. Everything about it is better, and it's about crossing over, and it was written to Hebrews in the first century to get them to cross over out of an old covenant paradigm into a new covenant paradigm. That's what Deborah is about here to me. It's trying to get you to leave an old covenant thinking that constantly keeps you feeling disqualified, unworthy. Uh, it robs you of your faith. When the law is preached according to Galatians chapter 3, it shuts up faith, for the law is not of faith. And then I showed you how J.L.'s weapon was a nail. And that nail, to me, points to the nail of Calvary's cross. Where on, uh, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, he nailed to his cross the handwriting of ordinance that was against us. And when I looked up this word nail in Strong's Concordance, it literally means, in, uh, in, in, it is used in Colossians 2.14, in which the figure of a bond or ordinances of the law is first described as canceled and then removed. The idea in the verb itself is not that of the cancellation to which the taking out of the way was subsequent, but of nailing up the removed thing in triumphant to the cross. The death of Christ not only rendered the law useless as a means of salvation, but gave public demonstration that it was so. So this nail is to nail those carnal thoughts between our ears that disqualify us. I don't think it's an accident that when Sisera comes to the tent of Jael, he turns in and he says, I'm thirsty. But instead of her giving him water to drink, she gives him milk. Now, if you're a Bible scholar, you know that milk is used if you're not exercised in the word of righteousness, you have need of milk and not of strong meat. So one of the things that we must settle within our thinking if we're going to win the battle between our ears is we're going to have to start drinking some milk. <laughs> we're going to have to give it some milk and then we're going to have to put the nail uh, right on the temple and take the hammer and drive that nail of the finished work of Jesus Christ down through the mind of Sisera, those warring mentalities, those battle horses that keep raging within our mind. You know, I, I look at people constantly that are tormented. I sometimes wonder, you know, just how much mental illness is a result of some of the legalism we've been preaching. My wife and I were talking the other day, and you know, she would grew up in legalism as well as I did, and I, and I don't mean this negatively because I believe those people did the best they could with what they knew, and they thought they were doing well. But she was just a little girl. She told me this story. She said, I was just a little girl. And she said, one day I wanted to cut my bangs. So I cut my bangs. And she said, I did a horrible job of cutting my bangs. But nevertheless, she said, when she went to church, her pastor looked at her and said, this is a little girl now who just cut her bangs. She said, my pastor looked at me and said, you're going to go to hell for that. And she thought, you know, I said, I, I can't imagine the devastation that has left in the minds of people who sat under that kind of warfare constantly, of you're going to go to hell over just every... I, I, I've seen people recently who are in mental uh, health institutions, and the biggest problem is condemnation and guilt and, and, and uh, 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 just torment of I'm never good enough, I'm never qualified. There are more casualties of people who left the church who say, I just can't live it. Because we've made it so stringent and strict, they say, I don't want to be a hypocrite because I can't live it. To that, I respond and say, welcome to the club. Neither can I. But the truth of it is, he can live his life through us. But we have to stop thinking that we are accepted 
or justified on the basis of our performance. We've got to take our emphasis off of us and put it on him. I am justified and sanctified on the basis of the offering of Jesus Christ once and for all. Let's put a nail on that stinking thinking and nail it to the cross. Then I showed you how that, that nail is also that she used there to nail that dude to the ground was also used in Deuteronomy chapter 23, where when the children of Israel came out of the wilderness, and there's three to six million of them, there is a uh, nightmare of where are we going to use the bathroom. And you say, well, what is that important? Well, it's in the scriptures in Deuteronomy chapter 23. God gave Moses instruction. And this is, I love how King James puts it. He says, and it shall come to pass that when thou shalt ease thyself abroad. In other words, when you got to go, you got to go. When nature calls, what are we going to do? He said, it shall come to pass that when thou shalt ease thyself abroad, that thou shalt go forth outside the camp. And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon. The word paddle there is the same Hebrew word that's translated nail here in the book of Judges. It is the same word used for nail where they nailed the handwriting of ordinance to the cross. Watch this. He said, thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon and thou shalt dig a hole and cover that which cometh of thee and then wash yourself with water and come back inside the camp so that when the Lord God walks among you, he doesn't see any uncleanness among you. Now, you may, and then you, you may not know this, but when uh, uh, Nehemiah rode into the city in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1 and 2, that he, the first place he came to was the dragon well and the dung port. The dung port was outhouse row. And so he, began, he came to that gate at the gate of the dung port that was outside the dung gate. Now you say, what is significant about that? Because if you take the map of ancient Jerusalem and you laid it over the city of Jerusalem when Jesus was crucified, Jesus was crucified outside the camp, outside of the dung gate. And this word for nail that's used here, same Hebrew word, was used to nail Jesus to the cross. You say, what does that mean? That means he took all of our byproducts of our flesh. He took our stinking thinking. He took all of the uh, uh, dung, and he took it outside the cross, all of the byproducts of our flesh. Now watch this, not just, not just what we call carnal flesh, but even fleshly things like what, here's what Paul says in Philippians. He says, I was born of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. As touching the law, I was blameless. Now watch that. He said, as touching the law, I was blameless, but I count all of that as dung that I might win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is a product of the law. Now remember what we're talking about here with Deborah and Jael and Sisera is we're dealing with this stake in thinking of old covenant righteousness versus new covenant righteousness. And what Jesus did was he took the handwriting of ordinance that was against you, nailed it, same word, nailed it to the cross, and spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. Took the weapon of condemnation from the enemy because the biggest, even in that chapter, Colossians chapter 2, he says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them, in it. And if you go down uh, through that chapter, what he took from the enemy here, again, was he nailed the handwriting of ordinance to the cross. When he disarmed principalities and powers, he took the weapon of the law out of the hand of the enemy so that that weapon that was formed against you called condemnation and guilt would not prosper but that he would redeem you in your thinking, in your stinking. See, that what you talk about stinking thinking. Outside the city, they dug a hole and they covered the byproducts of their stinking flesh. The, the byproducts of the dung. In other words, Paul said, I count all of that, that righteousness that was a product of the law, I count it all as dung, that I might win Christ. Jesus was crucified outside the city, outside the dung gate, same place Nehemiah went to. The same word that was used where they took a nail, dug a hole in Deuteronomy to bury that which cometh of thee, 
is the same Hebrew word. He's dealing with the stinking thinking of legalism and religious thoughts that war against our minds. We need to pull down those strongholds, those enemies that continually war in our mind. That's what I believe the Scripture is talking about when he says uh, that they've had their conscience seared with a hot iron. The Greek word for seared there is the Greek word katarizo, where we get our English word cauterize. In other words, when you cauterize something, you stop the flow of blood. I believe a lot of people will re be redeemed from mental health when we begin to start the flow of blood back again because the book of Hebrews says we need to have our conscience sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ, that those old covenant sacrifice could not make the commerce too perfect concerning the conscience. But when you see that the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of Calvary was enough and that you are not disqualified, you're accepted in the beloved on the basis of what he did and not on the basis of what you do, you will take a nail as well and put it on the head of Caesarea and you will nail that dude to the ground. And you'll say, I've got the victory over all these things that are tormenting me. I've got to tell you, I am mentally more healthy today than I've ever been because of the revelation of grace and the new covenant and that I'm accepted in the beloved. I have put a nail on some things that belong to Sisera, and I refuse to come back under those thinking again. If you come back under that thinking, give him some milk to drink, put him to sleep, and then drive a nail through it because I believe that's the battle that's going on is the one that's between our ears and, 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 and our soul uh, because we're doubly minded. Let me just quickly grab this out of uh, the Song of Deborah out of chapter 5, uh, and, and we'll kind of bring this to a close on Deborah. It says, Then Deborah, this is chapter 5, and Barak, the son of Abon, sang on that day, saying this was after they won the victory. When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. I believe that's a powerful song to sing, is that when we leaders will lead, when we get the guts to preach the new covenant, and the people do what they do, not because they have to, but because they want to, then you're going to see victory. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princess. I, even I will sing to the Lord. I will sing the praise to the God of Israel. Uh, Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from Edom, the earth trembled, the heavens poured, the clouds poured out water, the mountains gushed before the Lord, this Sinai, before the Lord God of Israel. It says, in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted, and the travelers walked by, along by the byways, and the village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, a mother in Israel. Village life, to me, speaks of the local church. I believe there must be a call to return back to the villages. You need community. You need to be around people of like precious faith, and you need to be in places where there have been some Deborahs, some Shamgars, and some people that are executing the judgment of the new covenant and not the old covenant, because that's what had happened is the village life ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose a mother in Israel. And when you start to see, I believe, people begin to arise. I believe that people have left the villages because they're weary and they're tired of religion that didn't pr produce anything. They've been promised the moon that produced nothing. And after a while, you can only be on a religious treadmill so long and operate from pe fear so long. But it, verse 9 goes on to say, My heart is with the rulers of Israel who offer themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. Speak you who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire, who walk along the road far from the noise of the archers. Among the watering places, they, there they all recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts of his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. Awake, Deborah. Awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives. And they begin to sing this song uh, 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 that they uh, are, are singing of victory. And uh, she goes, let me just go down to the last few verses. It said, verse 24, but most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Heber, the Canaanite. Blessed is she among women in tents. He asked for water. She gave him milk. She brought out cream in a lordly bowl. She stretched her hand to the tent peg, her right hand to the workman's hammer, and she pounded Sisera. She pierced his head. She split and struck through his temple. 
at her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. At her feet he sank, he fell, where he sank, there he fell dead. The mother of Sisera looked through the window and cried out through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his chariots? Now let me just tell you that that, she, it, 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 that to me summarizes what was happening in the song of Deborah. Now one of the things she does challenge is, even in this song, I didn't have time to read it all, but she, she begins to challenge and says, why, where, where, where were these other tribes? Why didn't you show up? Why didn't you come to help us? You sat back and you waited and you didn't come. Uh, Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death. Napoli also on the heights of the battlefield. The kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no spoils. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Caesar. In other words, she's challenging them. And she said, listen, man, you can't sit back. You have got, I believe the church at large has got to quit fighting each other. And we've got to begin to arise and join this battle. And this battle is not so much from without, from our enemies, but we are self-destructing from within. But we need to become unified in the preaching of the new covenant and of the grace of Jesus Christ. And we must be like J.L. We must bring milk in a lordly bowl. We must put the tent peg of, of, of the nail of the cross of Calvary and the finished work of Jesus right on the head of the carnal mind of religion and every other form of the carnal mind. I'm not excluding that. And take the nail and nail that dude to the ground and see the victory won for the people of God so that we can sing this song of victory and praise as God has brought deliverance. That's the kind of judgment I believe that God wants us to execute and this honor have all of his saints, not glow-in-the-dark preachers, not just famous uh, celebrity preachers, but ordinary people with ordinary backgrounds doing extraordinary things. You're called to that. You might be a Deborah in Israel. Let's put the nail to it. We're about out of time. Let me just say quickly, if you'd like to sow a seed into this ministry to help support what we're doing through the gospel, you can go to my website, and there's an easy place to give through our PayPal portal. You can give via credit card or debit card. And you can, if you want to, set up a monthly debit where you can give monthly as a monthly partner, or you can write a check and send it to the address that will come on the screen, or you can call the number that's on the screen, Someone will take your call. If you don't get an answer, please leave a return number where we can reach you. We don't stay on the phones 24 hours a day. So if you leave a message, we will have someone return your call where you can sow your seed into the ministry. But do it today because we do need your help. God bless you. I trust you've enjoyed this on Deborah. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.